Okay, I'll get started. Hope you can hear me clearly. I'm just showing you right now um, a graph that shows the distribution of scores for the test. So the, the average for test one is about 70%. There are a few problems, 16 scores still to be entered. So that average will probably creep up just a little bit. Um, if you want to think about how you're doing in the class, then think about um, your total score in the class with test one now done and with all the other assignments like the lecture quizzes, like the um, laboratory assignments, like the um, homework assignments, like the, the recitation problems. And think about that, that score that you have there. Uh, and that's where, you know, 90% or above is an A, 80% uh, and above is a B, and, and so on and so forth. If you want to chat or talk about your test one score or your um, or test one, if you have any concerns over your test one or your test one score, um, you can just send me an email and we can set up an appointment or if you wanted, we could talk at office hours, but either way is, is perfectly fine for me. Any questions on test one? Is there like a key for the free response? Um, you should see, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, you should see the correct answers for the true, false, and the numerical answer. And now I've got the, now I've got uh, er, all the makeups done. I will hopefully today post my solution for problem 16. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So I'll get that solution posted today and uh, then you can take a look at that. You may have got some feedback in the little um, chat box that comes with the test, or you may not. It's kind of hard for the graders to do that. Um, there's, so there's a question I see. So are the final grades posted? If you see your problem 16 grade posted, that is your final test one grade posted. If you don't see uh, problem 16 posted, and I know there are a few still to be posted, then that is not your final grade posted. Just to let you know, the, your recitation instructor graded your problem 16. So if you don't get your questions about problem 16 answered by looking at my solution to problem 16. Um, you could, well, you can talk to me about problem 16 and I, I can probably help you, or you can talk to your recitation instructor. I'm sure they can help you. If you had issues um, with submission of problem 16, are those issues a deficit? I got, I, I don't know how many, how many PDFs, emails, uh, JPEG emails sent to me after the test. I tried to make sure that I have passed every one of them on to the graders and the graders are getting those in. As I say, I'm not sure that every one of those cases is in yet. And um, if you don't see a score for your problem 16, let us know, you know, um, look, I'm not perfect for sure. Uh, I, I could have missed passing along one of those emails to a grader, or they could have missed grading a particular one that came in an email. So let's make sure we get that done, um, uh, get that completed. Any other questions on test one or your overall grades before I move on. Okay, let me share my lecture slides.
So today we're going to move on to a new topic. We're going to, for a while at least, leave behind electricity. Electricity is an old friend to me. Um, and we're going to introduce uh, magnetism. That's going to be our new friend. Um, later on in the class, we're going to see that electricity and magnetism are interconnected to one another. So we'll look at those interconnections, interrelations. But for now, we're going to kind of introduce magnetism and how it works in the same sort of way that we introduced electricity and, and how it works. So that's, that's our basic plan for the next handful of classes. Today's class, I want to focus on some introductory magnetic material. So I want to talk about magnetic attraction, magnetic repulsion, kind of like we talked about, remember electric attraction, electric repulsion. I want to talk about what we call magnetic North Poles, South Poles. They're analogous in many ways to electric positive charges, negative charges. And then towards the end of this class, or the second half of this class, I want to talk about um, what we call magnetic fields. And these are the carriers, the conveyors, the transmitters of magnetic forces, like electrical fields were the conveyors, the transmitters, the carriers of uh, electrical fields. You'll see a lot of parallels between what we did in electricity with what we're about to do in magnetism in today's class. But, and, and this would be, this is maybe a thing to think about as I work through today's material. Um, there'll be some important differences between electricity and magnetism, some really key differences between electricity and magnetism. And I just want to alert you to, to that, let you know about that. Okay, so, you know, I love giving little history lessons. Um, and um, I can't, you know, I can't give up this chance of getting a history lesson on magnetism. So where, when do we first learn about magnetism? When do we first discover magnetism? Well, it goes back again, thousands of years to antiquity, just like electricity. So you might recall that um, electric, electrical attraction, electrical repulsion between you know, rubbed objects, glass, silk, plastic, uh, wool, that was discovered more than 2000 years ago. Well, a magnetic attraction, magnetic repulsion uh, between naturally occurring ores, naturally occurring magnetic ores, magnetite, for example, that was also discovered um, more than 2000 years ago. So we have to thank, or I'm always doing this, we have to thank those ancient Greeks, those ancient Babylonians for both the first hints of electricity and attraction and repulsion and the first hints of um, uh, magnetism and magnetic attraction and repulsion. Look, nowadays we're more, I mean, more sophisticated in some ways maybe. Um, we're more sophisticated and we understand that, that electricity, those electrical attractions, repulsions were sort of glimpses at the electrical forces between the charged building blocks of matter. And also nowadays, we understand that um, those magnetic attractions repulsions are actually glimpses of the magnetic forces between moving charged building blocks of matter. So we have a deeper understanding today, a more thorough understanding today, but these forces were known Philosophers were aware of these forces thousands of years ago. Okay, why is magnetism important? Um, well, here's one reason. This is a practical reason. And then the next slide, I've got another why is magnetism important. It's more of a scientific reason. Um, so uh, this is a little bit weird to me, mentioning Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube and TikTok 
talking because I don't really know much about all these things. You know way more about these things than I do. But all these things, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so on, and so forth, rely on storing huge, absolutely huge amounts of data. And how is that data stored? Well, somebody's not writing it down. How's this data stored? It's stored as zeros and ones, and those zeros and ones, those bits are magnetic bits. They're magnetic zeros and ones. And today, in our modern world, we're storing absolutely huge amounts of data. This is a graph. This is a plot of horizontally. Let me, I've got to get this pen working again. Horizontally, that's, oh, well, we all know what that is. That's the year. And we're actually over here on the far right now. Vertically, this is the amount of data stored in our, in our magnetic bits. And um, it's an absolutely huge amount of data. So an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. And a gigabyte is a billion bytes. So uh, an exabyte is a billion billion bytes. It's a lot of data. And nowadays we're storing probably 50,000 billion billion bytes of data. And that's, you know, half of that. Uh, half of that is Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all sorts of other things I probably can't mention. So, um, we rely on magnetism. We rely on magnetism for our modern lifestyles. We rely on magnetism for all this information in our modern world. Okay, there's also, this is the one that really appeals to me, right? A huge scientific importance to the discovery of, of magnetism. There have been, over the past few hundred years, a couple of landmark scientific events where what seemed to be different, different things were unified together, joined together with a single understanding. And the two great unifications that I want to mention are the, the one that you, you met in 211, which is due to Isaac Newton, and the one that we'll meet um, in this class, 213, which is due to, um, uh, to Maxwell. The first one, Newton's one, was that he unified um, terrestrial motion, like basketballs and footballs and all that stuff, uh, with celestial motion, the motion of, you know, the planets and the stars and so forth. That was, that was absolutely huge breakthrough. The second great unification was the joining together of what seemed like very different forces, interactions, the force of electricity and the force of magnetism. And we'll see later in the course that these are joined together in what we call electromagnetism. So that's the second great unification in scientific history. Okay, so now let me get on with magnetic poles, which are analogous in many ways to electric charge. So electric charges were kind of the sort of the origins of that attraction and repulsion in electricity and, and magnetic charges are the origins of that um, repulsion and attraction in magnetism. So that's kind of why they're, why, why they're analogous to one another. Um, I'm just showing you a slide here of um, attraction and repulsion in magnetism. But I'm going to show you a demonstration in a moment. I made a little video. But you, 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 I'm sure know from 
elementary school. I can still remember this, you know, this moment in elementary school where we go to play with magnets. And you know that magnets have two ends to them. Bar magnets have two ends to them. And one we call the North Pole and one we call the South Pole. And upstairs here in this slide are pairs of magnets. And we've cleverly painted the South Pole's blue and the North Pole's red. And um, two like poles, so here's a South and a South next to one another, they repel each other. And two North Poles, there are also two like poles, they repel one another. But two unlike poles, a North Pole and a South Pole, they actually uh, attract one another. And so here, you know, if you were an ancient Greek, you would have done this with lumps of magnetite or something probably. But here we can now do it with nice little bar magnets we buy at the toy shop. Um, but like poles attract, two souths attract, like poles attract, two norths attract, and a north and a south or a south and a north. Sorry, I got that completely wrong. Uh, if anybody finds out, I'll be fired. Two south poles repel, two north poles repel, a south and a north or a north and a south attract one another. It's kind of like the electrical case with um, opposite charges and like charges. Let me show you a video of this to prove it. So I'm going to share a different screen now. Okay, so um, this was, I went in chemistry physics large lecture room this morning and made this little video. And I'm looking down on a table where I've got a, um, um, a bar magnet where in this case, the North Pole is painted red and the South Pole is painted white and it's on a little turntable so it can freely rotate. And I'm gonna bring up to this bar magnet another bar magnet. Again, it will have the North Pole painted red and the South Pole painted white. And we're going to explore the attractions and repulsions between the ends of the bar magnet. So let's, um, let's play this masterpiece. Here comes two like poles. And look, that, that North Pole of the bar magnet on the tur table that was repelled, that flew away. I think that's pretty dramatic. And I'm gonna do this a handful of times just so that we're all believers. Here I come again. So two North Poles, I bring them close together and that North Pole on the turntable, the one I'm not holding, flies away. It's repelled. Uh, now let's try it with the South Poles. So bring up the South Pole to the other South Pole and that South Pole flies away. Look, they're not touching. They never touch. This is action at a distance. Now, if I remember this right, I'm going to try um, attraction next. I think, yeah, look at that. That is brilliant. I brought up the North Pole to the South Pole and it pulled the South Pole towards the North Pole. That was attraction. We'll do that one again. Bring up the North Pole to the South Pole. It attracts that um, South Pole. So North and South Poles, opposite poles attract one another and um, like poles, they repel one another. Let me go back to the slides. And now one now I've talked about North Pole, South Pole's magnetic attraction repulsion. I want to answer the question, well, look, 
there was no contact. Those weren't contact forces, magnetic forces. Those were action at a distance magnetic forces. Let's explain that. We explain electrical action at a distance forces as being mediated with electric fields. Uh, we're going to explain um, magnetic action at a distance forces as being mediated by um, magnetic fields. So an analogous mechanism for electricity and magnetism. Okay, so the idea is that not only are electric forces mediated by electric fields, magnetic forces are, are mediated by magnetic fields. And although we can't see with our own eyes electric fields, we can't see with our own eyes magnetic fields, we actually can probe magnetic fields, electric fields with charges. We'll see how we do that. And that these fields are real. And we sketch, we draw these fields, both electric fields and magnetic fields with electrical field lines. It's just a useful tool, a useful scheme for picturing, representing these sort of invisible ghostly fields that convey these um, electric and magnetic forces. I've just drawn two examples here. Let's look at the one upstairs as a reminder first. So this is the electrical case. I've got a positive charge over here on the left. I've got a negative charge over here on the right. This is called electrical dipole, made of a equal and opposite charges. And as we met before, right, we see the, um, the pattern of field lines around the electrical dipole. So when the field lines are close together, say near the positive charge or near the negative charge, then that's a region of strong field. When they're loosely packed, far from the negative and positive charges, uh, that's a weak field. And the direction of the field lines, say radially out of the positive charge or radially into the negative charge, that indicates the direction of the field. And you see here that the field lines come out of the positive charge. It's like what we call the source. And they go into the negative charge. It's what we call the drain of a sink. Now here's the equivalent magnetic case downstairs. So instead of a positive charge and a negative charge on the left and right, I've got a North Pole and a South Pole and a, of a bar magnet on the left and right. And this creates a surrounding magnetic field. And again, we're picturing that field by sketching field lines. And um, again, if you look at this picture, the regions where the field lines are closely packed. So that's, you know, near the magnet, near the north and south poles of this bar magnet. That's a region of strong electrical field. And where the field lines are loosely packed, that's if you get far away from the bar magnet, that's where the, um, the field is much weaker. And the direction of the field lines, say over here on the far left near the North Pole, that indicates the direction of the magnetic field. And the direction of the field lines over here on the far right, that inter indicates the direction of the magnetic field there. Now, here's a subtle difference, or maybe it's not even a subtle difference. Look, in the electrical case, the magnetic case, these patterns look fairly similar, rather similar, I think. And in both cases, you've got either positive and negative charges or north and south poles. But whereas in the electrical case, the field lines actually came out of the positive charge and um, entered into the negative charge. The positive and negative charges were the sources and the drains of the field lines. That's not true in the magnetic case. In the magnetic case, look, the field lines come out the end of the magnet on the left. They return to the end of the magnet on the right, but the field lines themselves are actually complete loops. They don't have ends to them. They don't have beginnings to them. They don't have ends to them. They just form loops, complete loops. And so that's a difference between 
electric fields and magnetic fields. So this is what I was wanting to mention before I started today's material was that to note some of the differences between electricity and magnetism. And here's the difference between electric and magnetic fields. Okay, um, I wanted to mention that the most famous, if somebody asked me what, you know, what's, what's your favorite? What's your, what's the most famous magnet you know? Of? I think I would say the earth is my favorite, the most famous magnet. And you probably know that the earth is a magnet. And here's a picture of the earth as a magnet. So this is, um, get my pen working. This is the earth. Oh, we're somewhere up here. I don't know my geography is crap, but we're somewhere up here. And um, what you see is the poles of the earth. Now there's an interesting thing about the earth. So the earth, as you know, spins about an axis. So the, the vertical solid line here is the axis of rotation. And Upstairs here is the North Pole, what we call the geographic North Pole, the axis of rotation. And down here is what we call the South Pole, the uh, geographic South Pole for the, um, for the Earth's rotation. But there's another line with the solid line, this dashed line. They're a few degrees apart, and that's the magnetic axis. And actually, the North Pole, the geographic North Pole is approximately the magnetic South Pole and vice versa. The geographic South Pole is approximately the magnetic North Pole. And like the bar magnet, um, the magnetic field of Earth magnet, it comes out of the North Pole. The field lines come out of the North Pole and then they return to the South Pole. They actually make complete loops. It's not shown on this picture, but these field lines, these magnetic field lines are complete loops coming out of the um, uh, magnetic North and returning to the magnetic South. So the, the Earth looks like a, a bar magnet. Um, now I just make a, a few comments about the Earth being a magnet. So the reason it's a magnet is that in the, you probably know this, in the core of the Earth, wish I could go there, It'd be very interesting, is molten, molten iron. And iron is a magnetic material and that creates the magnetic field. It's uh, iron that's flowing around in the center of the earth. Uh, one interesting thing about it that we don't fully understand, don't completely understand, is actually the direction of the magnetic field has over the course of millions of years changed a number of times. So if you went back some th hundred thousand years, the magnetic north would actually be aligned with the geographic north and the magnetic self would be aligned with the geographic south. But right now, the magnetic north is aligned with the geographic self and, and vice versa. And as I say, we don't exactly know why the fields flip like that. It's a in very interesting problem why the fields flip but perhaps most importantly. So we, we've all got to, at this point, thank the magnetic field of the earth. Thank the earth for being a magnet because that magnetic field actually protects us from harmful, what we call cosmic rays or solar rays that come from the sun. It's kind of a blanket that protects us from those rays and, and saves our lives. And so without that blanket, without that protection, we might not be around. Okay, I wanna show you some demonstrations of the um, magnetic field of a bar magnet. And um, I'm firstly just gonna flip through a few pictures, I've got three pictures of the magnetic fields of a bar magnet. And then I'm going to actually show you the demonstration of the magnetic field of the bar magnet. So in this picture here, 
Here's the bar magnet. This is the south pole upstairs and the north pole downstairs. And in the neighborhood of this bar magnet have been placed little iron filings. And the interesting thing about the iron filings is that they're, they're magnetic, iron's magnetic, and they will tend to move towards regions of large magnetic fields, away from regions of small magnetic fields. They'll, they'll tend to align themselves, orientate themselves with the direction of the magnetic field. And that's exactly what you're seeing. So the little iron filings, God bless them, they're, they're mapping out the magnetic field for us. There's lots of them near the poles because the field is strong. And you can see that they're actually orientated in the directions of the field lines. The field lines come out like this. Not great drawing, I know. And the, the magnetic filings uh, are doing the same, showing the same pattern. And so with magnetic iron filings, magnetic iron filings, we can, we can actually visualize, we can actually see the magnetic field. So this is a single bar magnet. I'm going to show you two more cases. This here is the case of two like poles nearby one another. So upstairs here, we've got a bar magnet and here's its North Pole at its bottom end and downstairs is a bar magnet. Here's its North Pole at the top end. And so the, the field lines are coming out of the the magnetic field lines are coming out of the two north poles and they they effectively kind of repel one another just like the uh, the magnets will repel each other the the poles repel each other the field lines are kind of pushing each other away and you see them sort of turning away from the other the other magnets field lines uh, if you put um unlike poles together so let's do the other case Here's the pattern there. So here we got a south pole in the top bar magnet facing off against the north pole in the bottom bar magnet. And here the field lines from the north pole aren't pushed away from another north pole. They're actually attracted to the south pole. And so you see that attraction of the north and south poles is actually mirrored in the sort of kind of attraction of the, um, uh, the field lines themselves. So let me share another screen. I'll show you a demonstration of that. Actually, before I show you that, let me just stop sharing that one second. And I'm gonna show you the device I'm using that I used to, to, to make this video. Um, if I, I sort of buried it in my lunch somehow, here it is. Okay, so this, I can never work this out, this, box here contains um, oil, mineral oil, and iron filings. And the iron filings, uh, you can see is that sort of um, uh, sort of gray colored thing in the center of this box. And if I shake this up, then I'm distributing all the iron filings throughout the oil. And then I can put in a bar magnet. Here's a bar magnet. It's got a red end and a, a black end for the two poles. And I can put it in the middle of this distribution of filings. And it's a little hard to see in this here, but the, the filings are arranging themselves in the pattern of the field. So this is what I'm showing you in the video.
So this rectangular box is that rectangular box I just showed you. And you can see inside here, the north and south poles of the bar magnet. And this gray is just where I, I shook the hell out of this, uh, these iron filings. They're all over the place. And now we're going to watch them rearrange themselves. I, I find this absolutely mesmerizing. I, I spent half the morning watching this video. video. You see them moving and moving to form the characteristic pattern of the magnetic field that's created by a bar magnet. Um, you see strong regions of magnetic field near the, near the two poles, over here on the left and over here on the right. You see less filings further away from the magnet. And you see this pattern where the field lines come out one end and return to the other end. Come out this left end and return to the right end. Okay, so that's a single bar magnet. Now I'm gonna show you um, if I get two bar magnets, immersed in these iron filings and put them next to one another with um, the two north poles facing off, the two north poles close to one another. So let's look at the field patterns we get there. So here's, that's one bar magnet, the one on the left. And then this is the second bar magnet, the one on the right. You see the two black ends were neighbors. The two red ends were far apart. So the two light poles are neighbors, two, two, two north poles or two south poles next to one another. I, I can't remember which way around this is. And now you see that pattern where the field lines near the close ends of the light poles are kind of being pushed away. Just like those, those magnets are repelling one another. I could feel it when I, I put them in these devices the fields, they're being pushed away from one another. So that's, that's quite a nice demonstration, I think. Again, I could watch this for quite a while. And now I'm gonna show you the last case, right? We're gonna um, shake up the, the boxes again, the iron filings again. I'm gonna load it with the two bar magnets, but this time we're gonna have light unlike poles facing off, a north and a south pole. And um, that's the case where the magnets will attract. So let's see what happens here. And so you, here you can see in the middle, there's a red pole facing off against the black pole. So that must be a north and a south pole. And now you see a different pattern emerging rather than the field lines being pushed away from the poles that are close to one another, they're being pulled to each other. So it is a different pattern. And um, this is the attraction of the north and south poles. And you see it mirrored in this attraction of the, uh, of the field lines themselves. Okay, so that was fun. Maybe. Let me go back to my uh, slides. And we've looked at electric fields, magnetic fields, who compared the electric fields and magnetic fields. I just wanted to make this point about this difference about electric flux and magnetic flux. So I wanted to stress this uh, because this is a key difference between electricity and magnetism, between electric fields and, and magnetic fields. So let's start um, upstairs here. This is the electrical case. And this is a, um, uh, a point charge. And in electricity, isolated point charges exist. You can have a single positive charge. You can have a single negative charge. 
And isolated point charges are either what we call the source of electric flux, so the field lines come out of it, if it's a positive charge, or they're the kind of the drain, the sink of electric flux. The field lines go into it, disappear into it. So that exists in electricity, but the counterpart doesn't exist in magnetism. What I tried to draw here is an isolated uh, magnetic pole in an anal in analogy to the isolated electric charge. Magnetic poles, on the other hand, isolated magnetic poles, just a single magnetic north pole or a single uh, magnetic south pole, they don't exist. We've looked for them. Nobody's ever found one. Magnetic poles, magnetic south poles, magnetic north poles always exist in pairs. And that's a very fundamental difference between electricity and magnetism. So isolated north poles don't exist. This, in, this doesn't exist, this situation here with field lines coming out of a pole. Um, isolated south poles don't exist with field lines going into the south pole. There are no sources, what we call sources of magnetic flux or drains of magnetic flux. There's no beginnings and ends of magnetic field lines. So these are key differences upstairs here, downstairs here, between electric and magnetic fields, between electric and magnetic flux. Okay, so now I wanna get um, more quantitative. I wanna say exactly, I wanna say precisely how um, magnetic forces are mediated by electromagnetic fields, like we were precise about how um, electric forces were mediated by electric fields. And so I'm gonna introduce a new equation and we're actually gonna compare it to a old equation. So upstairs here, this is the old electrical case. And in particular, this is the relationship between the electrical force on the left, F, and the electrical field over here on the right, E, when a charge is placed in the field. And then downstairs, the counterpart for magnetism down here. The equation here, this is the relationship between the magnetic force F and the, um, the magnetic field that we give the symbol B. I don't know why. We give the symbol B for the magnetic field. When you place a moving charge, I'll explain this, in that magnetic field, you get a magnetic force. Now, this is a case where we have to, I have to be honest with you that the relationship between the field and the force was much simpler in the electrical case. The relationship between the field and the force is more complicated in the magnetic case. It's more complicated in both, you know, the sizes of the relationship between the sizes of the fields and the forces and the directions between the fields and the forces in the magnetic case. So in the electrical case, the way we imagine this equation that related the field that conveys the force was we thought of Q as kind of a test charge. We called it a test charge. It was like a little probe charge. And you carry it, so I've got it in my pocket. I've got one in my pocket here. And we can put that little test charge in some location in space. And by measuring the electric force on it, we can figure the electrical field at that location in space. And so it was a probe charge. It was a test charge that allowed us to figure the unseen, invisible, ghostly field by measuring the number of newtons of force on the test charge. And so that's, that was the how we connected um, the electric force to the underlying electrical field. And so this equation does the same sort of thing for the relating the magnetic force and the magnetic field. Now, in this case, the way we probe 
the ma the uh, again unseen invisible ghostly magnetic field is by measuring the number of newtons of magnetic force on a test charge. But this charge, I, I need another test charge this time because this one has to be a moving test charge. So that's an important difference. Our probe of electrical fields is just a charge that we place in the field. Our probe of magnetic fields is a moving test charge. Q is the charge of the moving chest charge. V is the velocity of the moving chest charge. So you need to put that moving charge in that region of space, and then it can probe the magnetic field. So that's a, that's a key difference. And so these are the two relations between fields and forces um, for electricity and magnetism that involve these concepts of a, a test charge and a moving test charge. And I'm, I'm gonna explain the magnetic equation a little more over the next, next few slides. But I think just on this slide, um, appreciate that that relationship between field and force is much messier in the magnetic case, is much simpler in the electrical case. Um, one place that it's clear that it's gonna be messier in the magnetic case, clear that it's simpler in the electrical case, is that in the electrical case, right, the, the, the force is either in the same or opposite direction as the electrical field. In the magnetic case, this is weird. In the magnetic case, the, the field, sorry, the force is actually at right angles, 90 degrees perpendicular to the magnetic field. That is weird, I think. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's explore this field equation for magnetism a little bit. No class is complete without me doing that. Oh, and let's do it again. So let's look at this, this relation in a bit more detail. And to start looking at this relation in a bit of detail, I, I firstly, I nicely color, proud of this, nicely color coded um, the various quantities in the equation. And the quantities I'm going to think about are the field, the force, and the moving charge. And I'm picturing them in the sketch below. And so in the sketch below in green, this is the magnetic field. So this vector represents the magnetic field. In red, this vector represents the motion of that te moving test charge. And finally, this vector here in blue is the force on that moving test charge. And so this is a picture of the relationship between the field we put the test charge in and the force that was experienced by the test charge. It's how all those things are interconnected to one another, interrelated uh, to, to one another. And so it's a picture of this equation here. Now, in the picture, there's some key things. The field and the moving test charge, those are represented by two vectors. So the field has a direction, the motion has a direction, the, the direction of B and the direction of V. Those two vectors, B and V, form a plane, like a sheet of paper. Here's the plane. And the magnetic force, as I said, is always right angles, perpendicular to that plane. That magnetic force that's right angles perpendicular to that plane is proportional to several things about the magnetic field and the moving test charge. It's in proportion to the strength of the field. 
So here's B. The bigger they make B, the bigger the magnetic force. It's in proportion to both the size and the speed of the test charge. The bigger you make Q or B, again, the bigger the magnetic force. And then finally, that magnetic force depends on this angle feeder that I marked here between V and B. And this sine theta dependence gives a really intriguing, interesting dependence to the magnetic force. So for example, if B and V are in the same direction, we're gonna see this on the next slide, that we'll see that the force vanishes. If V and B are opposite to one another, the force will vanish also. So you could have moving charged particles in a magnetic field, but experience no magnetic force. That, that's kind of weird. And then if the angle between V and B is right angles, that's when you get the strongest, the largest magnetic force. So that's all built into this equation. And so I'm, I'm trying to explain those two cases here. And so let's, let's just look at that in a little more detail. If V and B, the motion and the magnetic field are perpendicular, right angles, 90 degrees. So theta is 90 degrees, then sine theta is one. Then that magnetic force is mag maximized. It's the largest it can be for that particular strength magnetic field, that particular charge particle, that particular speed of the charge particle. That's how to maximize the magnetic field. If V and B are parallel one another, or actually any parallel, opposite one another, then in that case, theta is zero degrees, or say theta is um, 180 degrees, that makes sine theta zero. And in that case, the, the magnetic force is minimized, is actually zeroed. You get no magnetic force. And that is amazing to me. You can get this moving charge particle in this magnetic field and it doesn't, it just floats in there. It doesn't feel the force if it's going in those directions. And so that's a rather unique feature of magnetism. There's no analog equivalent of that in electricity. It's a unique complication of magnetism. In these regards, electricity is much, much simpler. Okay, so there's a, a handy rule for remembering this relationship of the directions. Now, I'm a little worried that I'm gonna demonstrate this to you and it's on this slide, but I think because the camera reverses everything that this will potentially be rather confusing. Um, but it's called the right hand rule and it's a sort of mnemonic for, for figuring the direction of the force on a charged particle. Now specifically, it's the force on a positively charged particle. And the force on a negatively charged particle is the opposite direction. I mean, that's a bit like electricity. The, the, we might, the field would tell us that that's the direction of the force on a, a positively charged particle and the field on a negatively charged particle is the opposite direction. But you do have to be careful that this rule, this right-hand rule is the force on a positively charged particle, force on a negatively charged particle is opposite. That's, that's a key point. Okay, so what you do with the right hand rule is you get your right hand. And I don't, I have big enough problems with left and right my whole life. Um, and I don't know whether to you this looks like my right hand or my left hand anymore, but this is my right hand. You point the palm of your right hand in the direction of the motion of that moving charged particle. So supposing it was going up, then I point my palm of my hand up here. And then you curl your fingers. You curl your fingers in the direction 
of the um, magnetic field. So I'm going to curl them towards you as if the magnetic field is coming towards you, it's flowing towards you. So again, moving charged particle is going up, the palm of my hand's going up, the field is coming towards you, my fingers are now pointing towards you, my right thumb is pointing in the direction of the force on a positive charge, magnetic force on a positive charged particle. So it will be over this way. If it was a negative charged particle, it would be the opposite direction. So remember that. So that's the right hand rule. It's clever. Okay, so here's on this slide a, a couple of examples of the right hand rule. We've got a region of magnetic field. It's from left to right on this slide. Uh, we've got moving charged particles on this slide. Um, there's a positive one and a negative one. They're, they're going upwards. And um, what is sketched is the direction of the field from left to right, the direction of the particles from bottom to top, and then by the right hand rule, the forces in blue are the force vectors. Let me just highlight them. The force on the positive charge, here it is, the force on the negative charge. Notice that those forces are right angles to the field and to the velocities. The forces are always at right angles to the field and velocities. And notice that in the case of the positive charge, try it out, try it out at home or whatever. But if you try it out with your right hand rule, pointing your, your palm in the direction of motion, so it would be up and curling your fingers in, in the direction of the field. So towards the right, you'll find that your thumb points in towards the screen. That's the direction of the force on the positive charge. And the rule is that the direction of the force on the negative charge is opposite that. And so that points out of the screen. And so that's an application of the right hand rule. Okay, so here I've got some, let's introduce that equation that relates electric forces, sorry, magnetic forces, magnetic fields, uh, and is the equivalent to that relationship between electric forces and electric fields. And now we've got a, a few examples in these last 15 minutes. And so this example, again, I would, rec you, you can watch me wave my hands around, right? And fiddle with this one. But I think we're in danger of what the camera is doing to my right hand and making things look like their left hands or something like that. I'm not quite sure whether this is true angle. I would recommend going through these yourself and making yourself a believer in the right hand rule, using the right hand rule to figure out the directions of the forces. But in this slide, there are four sketches of charged particles moving into regions of magnetic field. So this, this, let me get the pen going. Here's the first one. So this is where a charged particle on the slide is moving towards the right and it's moving into a region magnetic field. We use these crosses to denote a field that's going into the screen or into the slide. We would use dots to denote a field that's coming out of the screen, out of the slide. Okay, so this is a field going in. And so if you point your hand, you can try this as you're watching, if you, if you point the palm of your hand towards the right, I'm doing it, um, and then you curl your fingers in towards the screen, I'm doing that too, you find your thumb points upwards. And that's the right hand rule. That's the direction of the force, magnetic force on that moving charged particle. Downstairs here, this is an interesting one. So in this case, we've got a 
a magnetic field that is from the left to the right, and we've got a moving charged particle that's moving from the right to the left. Now, if you remember that equation, this is that case where that magnetic force intriguingly vanishes if you either travel along the fire field lines, parallel to the field lines, or travel opposite the field lines, any parallel to the field lines. So this is a case, we don't need the right-hand rule here, we just need that equation to say that in this case, the force is zero. It's because of the, or in the angle between the force, the sorry, the field and the motion is 180 degrees in this case. Same would be true if it was zero degrees in this case. Let's go upstairs to this one. In this one on the top right, well, the, the charged particle is moving towards the left. So I could point my palm, and I'm, I'm going to do it, towards the, um, towards the left. And then I'm going to curl my fingers in the direction of the, the field lines, which are going up. So I'm doing that. Looking at this won't be very helpful, I think. But I would encourage you to do this right now. No matter, I mean, you might be in the, I don't know, in, in um, Chick-fil-A right now. Well, just start doing this in Chick-fil-A. You, you won't get thrown out. Um, so my fingers are pointing up, curled up, and my thumb is pointing in towards the screen. So that would be the direction of the force on a, on a moving positively charged particle, but this is a negatively moving charged particle. And so the force on this negative charge is up, out of the screen, out of the screen. That's what that dot means. So this is outwards. Uh, there's a, a, there is a couple of things in chat. Um, so in the first example, is the field going towards us or away from us? Yeah, let me make that clear. When you see crosses, that means the field is going into the page. So you're above the page, the field lines are going past you and, and penetrating into the page. If you see dots, if this was dots in that first example, the field lines will come out of the page towards you. So that's a, a key, so that's an important point. Um, your hand, it's in the camera, isn't it? Okay, so that, look, there's a, this, the camera is unfortunately reversing <laughs> left and right, like a mirror will reverse left and right. And so I, I think, don't be looking at, I can look at my hand and I can use my own hand to figure out these directions. And I hope you're looking at, you're not, look, shouldn't be looking at my hand, look at your own right hand and using your own right hand to figure out these directions. Can you determine the charge from the right hand rule? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. So Anna Mercer is, a, you know, clearly wants to be a scientist. Yes, you can measure, it's a famous experiment actually, where people have figured the charge out, the sign of the charge by figuring whether it goes in the direction of the right hand roll, it's positive charge. If it goes opposite the direction of um, the right hand roll, then, then, then that's a negative charge. And so that, that is actually used in real experiments. The brilliant question um, to figure out the sign of charges. Okay, I've got a quiz question. Okay, so I think we're done with the quiz. Um, the answer is out of the screen. So the force on the electron is out on the screen. And again, with the right hand rule, you would point the palm of your hand in the, in the direction that the electron is moving. So it was moving from bottom to top. So the palm of your hand would be up like this. You would curl your fingers in the direction of the field. So the field was towards the right. So you curl your fingers towards the right. 
When I do that, my thumb points in towards the screen. So that would be a force on a positive charged particle. The force on the negative charged particle would be opposite, so it's out of the screen. There's a, there's a question in the chat that's an interesting one. Can you, can you answer these questions about the direction of the force without using the right hand rule? I mean, yes, you can. Um, there's a mathematical way of doing the right, kind of the right hand rule where you don't use your hand. But I think in this class, we really rely on the right hand rule. And it does take a little bit of time to get used to, but I would just practice it. Practice it on some of the examples in the check textbook. Check some of the examples in the textbook. You'll get used to it. You know, you may not like it like right now, but by the, by the end of magnetism, I, I think you'll you know you'll really appreciate the right hand rule. Maybe. Okay. I wanted to look at a example problem is this one here. So this is our little last topic for the last few minutes. We've gone to the equator, which after all this ice and snow, and then the rain sounds kind of nice. Um, of course, we get there and we, I'd moan because it's baking hot. Um, but anyway, we're at the equator and we learn that the magnetic field there is northwards, 50 microteslas. The electrical field there is downwards, 100 newtons per coulomb. Of course, there's gravity there too, 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. We've got to find the, um, the gravitational, magnetic, and electric forces on a, uh, on a moving electron that's traveling eastward at 6 million meters per second. And all that I've tried to picture in this slide. So this is a very busy slide. Um, there are three colors of arrows. So the magnetic field is, which points towards the north. So north in this picture is towards the right, is um, 50 micros Teslas. So that's, that's the field lines for the magnetic field. The um, electrical field, which is downwards, that's pictured in blue. And so that's, that's here. This was the magnetic field. This is the electrical field. It's downwards. And, and the gravitational field that creates the gravitational force, that's downwards too, 9.8 meters per second squared. So those are the three fields that carry the three forces, electricity, gravity, magnetism. And then I, I wrote down the characteristics of the particle. So it's an electron. Its charge is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs mass nine times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And then the speed is 6 million meters per second. So that was all the information. That information I reproduced on the next slide upstairs here. Oops. Oh, gosh. What's happening to me? Here's that information again. And now one by one, I walk through the calculation of the sizes. So here I'm calculating the sizes of the gravitational electric and magnetic forces. And then over here, I'm just denoting the directions of those forces. So I calculate the size using the numbers separately from writing down the directions. Uh, it, and that's a place where I'd use a right hand rule for magnetism. So the, the sizes of, of gravity and electricity are easy, right? Mass times acceleration of gravity, charge times el electrical field, just those products. And so here you find these forces, tiny forces on an electron. Its charge is tiny, its mass is charged, tiny. The size of the magnetic force 
Well, let's not worry about the direction right now, but its size is just QV, the moving charge particle, times the field it's in, times the sign of the angle between the magnetic field and the, um, the motion. So its charge is Q here, that's its size of its charge. Its speed is here, six millimeters per second. Here's the magnetic field. And the ma magnetic field and the motion are right angles to one another. The motion in this picture is out of the screen. And so here's the force I come up with there. And here's an interesting thing, right? You know, if we go to the equator, we think electricity, so we think gravity is the big force. That's the one we experience. But if you're a electron in, on vacation at the equator, and if you're an electron on, on vacation at the equator, you think that electricity and magnetism are the big force. Gravity is completely negligible to you. You're just feeling that electric and magnetic forces. And actually the biggest force of all is the magnetic force on the electron. The gravitational force is downwards. Gravity pulls all objects downwards. The electrical force is upwards because the charge was negative. So it's opposite the field direction. And then the magnetic force is downwards. And you can work that out with the right hand rule again. You know it's going to be perpendicular to the field direction, which is over towards the right. You know it's going to be perpendicular to the motion, which is out of the screen. And so there's only up and down left. And if you use the right hand rule and the fact that the electron is negative, you find it's downwards. Okay, I'm going to end there. And let me just summarize that in today's class, we talked about magnetic attraction and repulsion. We talked about magnetic north poles and south poles. And we talked about magnetic fields as carriers, mediators, conveyors of magnetic forces. And we met this field equation for the magnetic force that an analogous to the field equation for the electrical force.